in a suburb of Paris, you'll find the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. There in that building, in an underground vault, you'll find under three bell jars, a jar on top of a jar on top of a jar, a little hunk of metal, the super stable metal, platinum iridium. This little chunk of metal has served as a worldwide standard for the kilogram for some 130 years. It was minted in 1889, and it has been the definition of the kilogram for over a century. So it's interesting that copies of it exist all over the world. They could be brought back together every few decades, checked, recalibrated, compared, so that they all match that standard in that basement. But scientists a couple of years ago decided to move away from this Grand K, as it was nicknamed, and move to a mathematical constant in the universe. Why? Well, when they brought those copies back together every few decades, what they would find is that there were little differences and they didn't understand why. Maybe it was microscopic contamination. Maybe somebody had gotten a little too aggressive in cleaning one of them and had lost a little weight. But for whatever reason, they felt that they couldn't trust that standard that had stood for centuries, absolutely. So they moved away from it. Now these were microscopic differences. It didn't affect your bathroom scale or the produce scale at your grocery store. But it does illustrate nicely the point, doesn't it, that mankind, when they choose to set a standard, they're limited in what they can control. So a standard that man sets is subject to change, isn't it? Only Jehovah can say, like he did at Malachi 3, 6, I am Jehovah, I do not change. Only our loving Heavenly Father can set a perfect, unchangeable standard. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look in God's Word, this perfect standard that He has set, and we're going to look primarily in one chapter, Proverbs chapter 3, and we'll look at some practical things that we can take away from this one chapter of God's Word. And hopefully it will build our confidence in this standard that our Heavenly Father has given us. Now we might just revisit one more detail about that little standard that existed in the basement in Paris. And that detail is the way that those changes were handled. Every few decades, they'd bring every copy of it that existed around the world back together, and they would compare them. Now, when they found the differences, they weren't sure which one had changed. But what did they do? Well, arbitrarily, that one Paris was the definition of the kilogram, so all the other copies were adjusted to match that standard, whether that standard had fluctuated or not. Doesn't that also illustrate what the world can do sometimes? As public opinions change, as times change, as technology changes, doesn't the world encourage you and me? You need to change with the times. You need to change your standard to meet the fluctuating standards of this system of things. So this is a key reason why Jehovah's standard is so valuable to us. Jehovah's promise that he has given us a standard that we can place our confidence in builds our faith. It builds our hope in the future. So it's good for us to constantly reevaluate re how much we are making Jehovah's standard our standard. So let's begin to do that. Let's notice as we begin in Proverbs chapter 3, the loving invitation from our Heavenly Father right away in verse 1. It says, My son, do not forget my teaching, and may your heart observe my commandments, because they will add many days and years of life and peace to you. Do not let loyal love and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and good insight in the eyes of God and man. So right away, we see this loving invitation from our Heavenly Father to make His standard our standard. Don't forget my teaching. 
where you notice in verse 3 it says, Write them on the tablet of your heart. Make Jehovah's Standards a part of who you are as a person. And how will that affect you? Well, it's like it says in the first part of verse 3, tie them around your neck. When we make Jehovah's Standards a part of who we are, it will be evident like this valuable ornament hanging around our neck. All who see us, like it says in verse 4, Jehovah God himself and right-hearted mankind will see in whose name we come. One reference work stated that that valuable ornament may have indicated a signet ring that an emissary of the king would wear. All who met him would see in whose name he came because of that valuable ornament that hung around his neck. Isn't that the same for Jehovah's faithful servants? See, when we make Jehovah's standards part of who we are, when people see evidence of it in the decisions that we make, the way that we treat others, it's like this valuable ornament that's, that shows people that we're coming in Jehovah's name. So what a beautiful, loving invitation from our Heavenly Father to make His standard our standard. So let's do that. Let's look at this primarily this one chapter of the Bible today. And we'll look at some practical things that we can take from God's Word that we can apply in our own everyday life ways that we can show that we're making Jehovah our confidence. So let's continue and look at our first practical takeaway point. Starting there in verse 5, trust in Jehovah with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways take notice of him and he will make your path straight. Do not become wise in your own eyes. Fear Jehovah and turn away from bad. It will be a healing to your body and refreshment for your bones. So do you notice the loving reminder from our Heavenly Father to trust in Jehovah with all our heart? And here's the key point. Do not rely on your own understanding. If we're honest, isn't that kind of our default setting as imperfect humans to rely on our own experience, our own way of thinking, our own perception of things? How often do we hear people say, well, I'm just a straight shooter. I call them like I see them. But what's the loving reminder from our Heavenly Father? Trust in Jehovah. Don't rely on our own understanding. That can be easier said than done sometimes, can't it? To take notice of Jehovah, as verse 6 says, in all our ways. But this is the loving reminder from our Heavenly Father. Do you notice how that verse, do not rely, could also be translated in the footnote? It says, do not lean on your own understanding. And doesn't that nicely illustrate what our own thinking can be? It's like a crutch we get out from time to time and lean on. It, it's easier to just say what comes to mind. But Jehovah's loving reminder is, when we don't know what to do, turn to him. His promise in verse 6, He will make our path straight if we look to His standard before we make a decision. How could we illustrate that scripturally? Well, what about the scriptural, uh, the scriptural counsel found at 1 Corinthians chapter 7? To marry only in the Lord. Now, we see clearly Jehovah's standard, don't we? But how could our imperfect human tendency to rely on our own understanding have an impact on this clear scriptural directive? Well, one article explained it this way. It said, in this case, emotions may interfere with sound thinking. We might begin to feel that there's an exception to be made in our case. So you picture a person who's been looking for a mate for some time, they've been trying to find someone in Jehovah's organization and they haven't been successful. And now someone at work starts showing them attention. See, could our own understanding of matters start to help us or make us reason, well, this person seems just as nice as people at the Kingdom Hall. They seem honest, they seem hardworking, they seem kind. See, could it be, without knowing it, that we're starting to ask Jehovah, well, couldn't you just 
let your standard fluctuate a little in my case. My circumstance is unique. But what's Jehovah's loving reminder? Do not rely on your own understanding. So at these times, it can be especially important. And it certainly not is, is not limited to this one example. We all have things that are emotional for us. And we find ourselves reasoning, I see your standard Jehovah, but couldn't it just be altered a little bit in my case? But what's Jehovah's promise? If in those times when it's difficult, when we find ourselves struggling, to turn to Jehovah, what's his promise to us? Verse 8, it will be a healing to your body and a refreshment for your bones. So Jehovah's promise is that when we, we trust in him, when we turn to him, when we look to his perfect standard for clear direction and make the tough decisions, even when it's an emotional issue for us, his promise is that we'll have peace of mind. Haven't you experienced that in your own life? When you do things Jehovah's way, when we don't get off on a tangent because of our own way of thinking, that Jehovah blesses us. He gives us a calm heart. He gives us real peace of mind because we did things his way. So there's our first practical takeaway point from Proverbs chapter 3. That loving reminder from Jehovah to not rely on our own understanding. Let's move forward a few verses, and let's notice two more practical points that we can take from this chapter. Let's continue in verse 9. It says there, Honor Jehovah with your valuable things, with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your storehouses will be completely filled, and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of Jehovah, and do not loathe his reproof. For those whom Jehovah loves, he reproves, just as a father does a son in whom he delights. So let's look at two specific points in those few verses. First of all, in verse 9, honor Jehovah with your valuable things. And then the second point we'll consider in verse 11, my son, do not reject the discipline of Jehovah. How about that first invitation from our Heavenly Father to honor him with our valuable things? This is an undeserved privilege that Jehovah offers to us. To take stock of our valuable things, our time, our energy, our talents, our material resources, and offer him our best. He doesn't ask any more than what we can give, but he does offer us the privilege of taking stock and seeing what we have to give in support of his interests. Now this can be hard to quantify in some of those other areas, our time, our energy, our talents. So let's take that example of material assets and we'll compare the value of material things in this system of things versus material things when they're used to support kingdom interests. Let's take just two US dollars as an example. So in your mind, as we talk for the next couple of minutes, make a mental list of what you could do with $2. Likely it's a relatively short list. But now let's revisit those same $2 and look at what's possible when they're used to support kingdom interests. Here's dollar number one. It says this note was submitted by three-year-old Shelley and her mother lovingly interpreted her childish scrawl at the bottom of the letter. Here's what Shelley wrote. Dear brothers, how are you? I want to be a missionary when I grow up. Please use this dollar to help missionaries. There's dollar number one. How about dollar number two? Stephen's a little older. He wrote his own note. He said, Dear Bible and Tract Society, I'm eight years old. I live at 89th Street. I hope you're having a fun time. I'm giving you $1 for the Kingdom Hall Fund. Send me a letter back soon. So there are $2. Now think about your mental list of what you could do with $2 in this system of things. That short list of what $2 can do. Now let's think about those $2 that Shelley and Stephen 
chose to give to Jehovah. Do you think the, the person at the branch who received that letter was moved by it? Absolutely. Do you think they called someone else into their office to share the letter with them, to share the joy with them of reading this letter? Absolutely. Do you think they took the time to reply to those letters? Absolutely. It meant enough to them that they submitted it to be included in an article. Now these citations are old. They're decades old. So Stephen and Shelley are all grown up right now. But yet here we are talking about them decades later, and it still brings us joy. Do you think the impact is any different for the sovereign of the universe when he looks at a little young person standing on their tiptoes in the kingdom hall trying to put a dollar in the contribution box. That's the power of material assets when they're used to support kingdom interests. It's far beyond the value of using them in this system of things. So Jehovah's loving invitation is to take stock of what we have to offer and give him our best. And his promise is that he will shower us with blessings. Do you notice what it says in verse 10? Then your storehouses will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. So what a beautiful invitation to honor Jehovah with our valuable things. How about that second takeaway point from these couple of verses? My son, do not reject the discipline from Jehovah. This is not always an easy thing to do. In fact, the Apostle Paul made a very sweeping statement about discipline, Hebrews chapter 12, and he quoted those verses that we just read. If you look in Hebrews chapter 12, and notice there in verses 5 and 6, we can reread what we just read in Proverbs chapter 3. It said there in Hebrews 12, starting in verse 5, and you have entirely forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not belittle the discipline from Jehovah, nor give up when you are corrected by him. For those whom Jehovah loves, he disciplines. In fact, he scourges everyone whom he receives as a son. So why did the Apostle Paul choose to revisit these verses with his brothers and sisters? Verse 11 gives us the answer. Notice this sweeping statement about discipline that the Apostle Paul makes. It says, true, no discipline seems for the present to be joyous, but it is painful. Yet afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Paul brought this up because he said, no discipline will be easy to take. Isn't that true for us? It can take many forms. It can come from our personal Bible reading. It could come from a personal study of Bible-based publications. It can come from something that was said from the congregation. Or it can come from some tailored counsel that an imperfect fellow brother or sister might offer to us. And in all of those circumstances, there's a level of discomfort, isn't there? But what's the loving reminder from our Heavenly Father? Well, notice what the Apostle Paul, if you're still there in Hebrews chapter 12, encouraged his brothers and sisters to focus on when they start to feel that discomfort, when they start to feel a little upset that an imperfect person maybe is drawing something to our attention. Here's really where the focus should be. Verse 5 again. And you have entirely forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. Or verse 7, you need to endure as part of your discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? That's where Paul encouraged his brothers and sisters to focus. That discipline, whatever form it takes, is evidence of Jehovah's fatherly love for you and for me. So when we find ourselves struggling to accept some discipline, when we find it hard to take, focus on that beautiful truth that Jehovah loves us enough to give us the tailored help that we need to continue to serve him faithfully.
truly we can accept discipline in whatever form it comes when we see it as evidence of Jehovah's fatherly love for us. So there's two more very practical things we can take away from this one chapter. To honor Jehovah with our valuable things and to accept discipline no matter what form it takes. Let's consider another very powerful tool that we can use in our life as Christians. Notice in the coming verses the value of real godly wisdom versus material riches that this world offers. Let's pick up our discussion in verse 13 of Proverbs chapter 3. It says there, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who acquires discernment. To gain it is better than gaining silver and having it as profit is better than having gold. It is more precious than corals. Nothing you desire can compare to it. Long life is in its right hand, riches and glory are in its left hand. Continuing in verse 21, it says, My son, do not lose sight of them. Safeguard practical wisdom and thinking ability. They will give you life and be an adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way in safety, and your foot will never stumble. When you lie down, you will have no fear. When you lie down, your sleep will be pleasant. You will not fear any sudden terror, nor the storm that is coming on the wicked. For Jehovah will prove to be your source of confidence. He will keep your foot from being caught. This is why it is so valuable for us to make Jehovah our confidence now, even in the seemingly small decisions that we make every day as his servants. When we are building up this pattern of looking to Jehovah, looking to his word, looking to his perfect, unchangeable standard, and calibrating ourselves accordingly. Jehovah is telling us this same practice will benefit us through the last days of this system of things, through the great tribulation that is coming, and the end of this system of things that we know is certain to occur. And it's not just a matter of getting through it. We know that some of us as individuals will suffer. We may even lose our lives, but we can continue to have real confidence in Jehovah's purpose. Notice how those verses describe that. Several times in those verses it talks about your feet. Verse 23, you will walk on your way in safety. Your foot will never stumble. Or verse 26, he will keep your foot from getting caught. What a loving reminder from our Heavenly Father that no matter how unstable this system of things gets, no matter how unstable our personal circumstances get, we can stand on solid ground if our confidence is in Jehovah. Jehovah's promise is that we can have peace of mind. Verse 24, when you lie down, you'll have no fear. Your sleep will be pleasant. Jehovah promises us stability and peace of mind no matter what this system of things throws at us, if we continue to make Jehovah our confidence in everything we do in our life. So what a beautiful reminder from our Heavenly Father to look to his perfect, unchangeable standards. Jehovah's standards have not changed and will not change. We can have absolute trust in them. But not only surviving, making it through hard times, but we can also have confidence in what Jehovah promises for the future. Let's consider just a couple of verses right before where we started today. Proverbs chapter 2. And notice what else we can have confidence in as his followers. Proverbs chapter 2. And notice verses 20 through 22. So follow the way of good people and stay on the paths of the righteous. For only the upright will reside in the earth and the blameless will remain in it. As for the wicked, they will be cut off from the earth, and the treacherous will be torn away from it. So we have good reason, don't we, to make Jehovah our confidence right now in our lives as Christians. It's that same confidence that will get us through the end of this system of things, but we have absolute confidence that Jehovah will be true to his word, and we have the hope of seeing everlasting blessings if we continue to look to Jehovah as our confidence.